We're, we're resuming our Philippian study. I feel like that the last time I talked about letting your moderation be known was a little bit too fast. So I want to take some time to expound on Philippians 4 about the moderation. It has a lot of good gleanings over there. All right? Yeah. All right. Some of you don't like your flesh to be kicked, but this is good for you. Yeah, amen. About your moderation. All right? All right. Philippians chapter 4. All right. This is a very good passage, and it's your memory verse this week. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5. Easy to memorize, hard to do, right? <laughs> the Bible says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Okay, so I'm going to expound on this again. I know I talked about it last time, but I'm going to try to go a little bit step by step. But I tr I'll try not to be redundant since the people heard this last time. Fresh reminder is that the verse is saying that what your own moderation, God wants to make sure that you let it be known unto everybody. So when people notice your moderation, it has to be known unto everybody. That's the first rule. How do you know that you're balanced, that you're moderate enough? One, does it appear that way to people? Does it appear that way to people? I mentioned to you before that there's nothing sinful about wearing makeup, but does it appear to others that you're very, very vain? So then you'll know how much makeup is too much makeup. How much uh, is drinking too much coffee? Too much coffee. Uh, how much is watching TV, uh, messing with the internet, video games, too much? Well, how does it appear to other people? You have to think about that. If it doesn't appear, if it appears to other people that you're spending too much time on it or you're too vain or you're abusing it, then what that means is you have to check yourself. Sometimes people might think, well, I'm moderate, I'm balanced. Well, no, you might think so, but not to other people. So that's why it's so important to do that. As a Bible-believing pastor, I might say that I'm spiritual, I'm right with God, but do members perceive me that way? That's why I can't just think that, oh, I'm spiritual enough, or I'm good enough, or I didn't do anything wrong in the church. No, do, do, I, do my actions appear as if I'm not spiritual to other people? So I have to be mindful of others. That's such an important rule. Otherwise, you're, you're not moderate then. You're going to mess up in your life. Sometimes when you think you're moderate, you could deceive yourself. The Bible says the heart is desperately wicked above all things who can know it. You can deceive yourself. The Bible says, be doers of the words, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So you have to follow and do the word. What did the word of God say? Does it appear that way? Second thing is, the Lord is at hand. So in other words, Jesus is coming soon. So the imminent return of Jesus Christ should make you think about, well, when Jesus comes right now, while I'm watching this thing, does it please the Lord? So that will definitely fix your moderation. You know, you might use that ex moderate excuse against your pastor, you know, against somebody else, and say, well, you know, you can't tell me it's a sin. It's not a sin. And I could, I'm sure the Lord approves of what I'm doing. It's, I'm okay. There are other Christians who do it. And who spend more time than I do on this thing, and they are considered to be more abusive, and I'm not. And okay, you can say that, and you can use those excuses on me, but when Jesus Christ comes right now and you know it, you might have second thoughts. If he caught you doing what you're doing right now, is that something that you'd be proud of to show to Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ? That, hey, Lord, yeah. I'm okay with doing this thing, and look what I'm doing, Lord. This is for you. You like to catch him, uh, you, would you like to ha have him catch you doing that at the rapture? What's the last thing that you'd want to be doing in your life? What do you want to end your life doing? Is the last thing that you want to do in your life when Jesus raptures you up to heaven is doing that thing that you feel at liberty your flesh likes to do? Is that really what you want to be known by the Lord? The last moment of your life. See, that's something to think about. 
So these are two things that will be extremely helpful to you to know what your moderation level should be. How does it appear to other people? And then you have to think about the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Now turn to Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. So are you balanced in the things that you're doing? Are you balanced in your work life or are you a workaholic? Are you balanced in uh, where you play or do you spend too much time messing around and playing? Are you balanced in your Christian walk with the Lord? If you're not balanced, if you're abusing on either side or the other side, then if Jesus Christ were to come right now and catch you doing that, how proud would you be or how embarrassed would you be? And if it didn't appear as a good testimony to other people all that time, then you should question. You should have a second thought of what you're doing. Now, Proverbs 25, we're going to examine, interestingly, every single passage that would talk about moderation or don't abuse in something would include the rapture here or the coming of the Lord. So it's so interesting. Let's look at several of these cases. Proverbs chapter 25, notice that the Bible says that you're not supposed to spend so much time uh, eating honey unless uh, what happens, then it's uh, a little bit too much for you. All right, um, verse 16, hast thou found honey, eat so much as sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomited. So notice right here that when you eat honey, Eat as much as is sufficient for you. So when you're studying the Word of God, reading the Word of God, and coming to church and getting into deep doctrine, I mean, the Bible says, uh, the Bible commends you for doing it, but it says as much as is sufficient for you. If you abuse it, then you're going to throw it up. And you can tell some of these people who are like, oh yeah, reading the Bible, studying the Bible, and doctrine, doctrine, and then you're like, well, praise the Lord, he's a Bible believer, but then you kind of get a little nervous too and you're like, okay, is this guy going to be a troublemaker in the church? Why? Because they just study so much Bible that when you talk to them, you feel tense around them. You can't enjoy fellowship with them. You feel like that this guy is always critiquing you. This guy is prideful. Or this guy, all he wants to talk about is Bible, Bible, but then he can't even talk normally with you. So you can't enjoy normal fellowship with them. I mean, as, as your pastor, who's a teacher of the Bible, do you see me come up to a person and then automatically quote them Genesis 1-1 when I first meet them? Or am I normal? See, that's very important. Even yours truly, who studies a lot of Bible, has to understand there's a time and place for something. So you have to talk normally with people, don't get too much into the Bible, otherwise you're just going to throw up. That's why Calvinists have so much pride, hyper-dispensationalists abuse dispensationalism. Why? Oh, they study so much Bible, and trust me, when you debate Bible with them, it will make you throw up. Why? Because they spend all their days studying the Bible, and that's it. Their, their evangelism, their spiritual walk is dead. You can read so much Bible, study so much Bible, and still be spiritually dead. You think about that one for a while, okay? Now, uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Why? Because God, what's the purpose of the Word of God? Not just reading it, but to read so you can learn and apply and do it. That's why it's so important. The Bible says, be doers of the Word, not hearers only. Otherwise, you deceive yourself. Can you imagine a person who read through the Bible so many times but, and then graduated from, I graduated from PBI and I know all the doctrines. I memorized tons of verses. I read through the Bible 200, 300 times and then at the judgment seat of Christ that uh, they get very small reward. They don't get much. That'd be shocking, right? Now, if you turn to 1 Corinthians 6, and actually I made a mistake. I forgot to show you Proverbs 25. Look at this one. So... Uh, I'll read 1 Corinthians 6, but I want you to go to Proverbs 25 again. I forgot to show you about the imminent return of Christ is mentioned as well. But 1 Corinthians 6, another thing that you shouldn't abuse in, the Word of God reads at verse 12, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. 
So in other words, Paul's saying that, sure, uh, the Lord might allow you to do those things. It's legal and it's not sinful, but it's not expedient. So it's not beneficial. Overall, it's not beneficial and good for you. Uh, the verse says, you will not be brought under the power of any. See, that's so important. Are you brought under its power? Are you abusing it? So many people live off of abuse that God don't like that. So then, are you abusing in that fleshly thing you're doing? Oh, it might not be sinful, concerning about the music you're listening to, the show that you're watching, or the people that you're hanging around with, or uh, what you put in your mouth, or what you put through, uh, in your eyesight and through your ears and where you go. But then sometimes you have to wonder if it, uh, it may be lawful, but is it expedient? Or do you see it as something where you're getting more fleshly, huh? Then you're brought under its power. You're brought under its power and there's something wrong with you. And you got to check your heart. So if we look back at, uh, if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, notice that the context we see the judgment seat of Christ mentioned. Look at verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Look at that. It has to do with your inheritance. So again, it all ties to the imminent return of Jesus Christ again. And it's so interesting. When Paul talks about moderation, it's like the rapture is not out of his mind. Yeah. But Christians, when they talk about moderation, rapture is always out of their mind. Yeah. They don't think about the rapture. They always justify what they're doing then you know you're not being spiritual, you're being more fleshly. Let's look at Proverbs 25. Look at verse 7. All right, notice right here that we get a picture of the rapture here. Come up hither when the king calls you. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 7. For better it is, said, uh, it is that it be said unto thee, Come up hither. Then thou, then that thou shouldest be put lower in the presence of the prince whom thine eyes have seen. Look at right here, a king calling a servant home. God is our king, we're his servants. And then when they say come up hither, you know what that means in Revelation 4 and Revelation 11, that means rapture. So we see right here that indication of the rapture is in Proverbs 25 where it also talked about eating uh, as much honey as is sufficient for you, not to abuse it. Amen. How about that? All right, going now to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, you can even lose a crown. That is so important. Didn't you know that? If you don't practice moderation, or you think you're practicing moderation, but you're not really doing it, then you can lose your incorruptible crown. Now, the incorruptible crown is one of the five crowns in heaven. How do you get the incorruptible crown? How you get the incorruptible crown is self-control. See that? Now, moderation, it's all about that. Self-control. Now, when you don't have good self-control or discipline, so let's put self-discipline. If you don't have that, then guess what? You're not going to get the incorruptible crown then because all the time you just kept justifying your action. Well, there's nothing sinful of what I do. Hey, I need my own moment, my own time, and there's nothing wrong with that. Give me a scripture verse on why it's wrong. And, you know, I get kind of sick and tired of people who ask me that one. Give me a scripture verse that what I'm doing is wrong. You don't need to. That shows uh, your heart already. You're fleshly. You want to hold on what you want to hold on to. You're not mindful about what pleases God and that if he were to come right now, if you want to remain that way, be my guest, then lose your incorruptible crown. You don't believe me? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The Bible says that Verse 25, and every man that striveth for the mastery is what? Temperate in all things. See, that's self-control, disciplining yourself. Notice temperate in what kinds of things? Some things? 
No, all things. All things. So it can be something so small and so minuscule, but guess what? If you fail in that one, then you're not temperate. How about that? How about that? Uh, look at the remaining part. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are what? An incorruptible. Notice verse 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. See, it all has to do with self-control, moderation over what you're doing, your flesh. If you don't have that, you're not going to get the incorruptible crown. So verse 25, notice that the imminent return of Jesus Christ is in Paul's mind again. Like, I'm going to lose that crown then if he were to come. Everything tied to judgment seat of Christ. Let's also look at 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7. Verse 31. And they that use this world as what? Not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. For I would have you without carefulness, he that is unmarried married, careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married carried for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Notice right here that Paul is saying that there are uh, there is such a thing as using the world, but there is such a thing as abusing the world. So you have to be modern in that. Well, what's wrong with technology? Nothing wrong. I mean, I got saved through watching your video, Pastor Kim. Well, praise the Lord. I went to a Bible-believing church because of your video, Pastor Kim. Well, praise the Lord. So nothing wrong with the Internet in that sense, but are you abusing it? You're watch spending too much time sitting down and watching stuff. And then unless you have a screen, then you can get into something spiritual then. That's how much you need a screen. Then it shows, see, you're brought under its power then. You became an addict. Notice that there are people who spend so much time into the world. Verse 30, they're abusing. They're not moderate. There's no balance here. And they that weep as though they wept not. And they that rejoice as though they rejoice not. And they that buy as though they possess not. Paul recognizes that there are some people who just spend too much time on weeping as if they never wept before. Spending too much uh, fun time on something as if they never spent a fun time before. And uh, buying all kinds of things in, the, in this world that, as if they never bought before. But what did Paul warn them at verse 29? Jesus is coming soon. Why are you spending too much time in this world? Verse 29, but this I say, brethren, the what? Time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. So Paul is rebuking some of these people who are uh, getting into women or so much time into their wives that God is saying, as if you were never married to begin with. So you're just spending too much time on that one rather than thinking about the Lord. Why? Because he's coming soon. Then what good is all that? What good is all that? All right, let's go back. Uh, well, no, let's go to Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Galatians 5. So before you think there's nothing wrong with your job, with the people you hang around with, or the stuff you have in your home, or what you're spending in your convenient time, or your certain hobbies, remember this. You have to be moderate in it. If you're not moderate, then what if the Lord were to catch you and would you be proud of what you did for the Lord? All right? Remember this. He can come any moment. So in other words, while you're doing that thing, that fleshly thing that you think is not sinful and you're moderate on, just remember this. Do you want, uh, at that moment, it could be the rapture. Okay? That speaks volumes. That fixes your moderation. That fixes your moderation. And another thing, don't forget, how does it appear to others? It's that simple. Absolutely. These are two important rules that help you in moderation. Now, Galatians chapter 5. Notice that Paul says, verse 13, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So notice right here that, yes, we are not bound as much as the Old Testament Jews were bound, right? To do these, all these things uh, to please the Lord. 
So we've been called unto liberty. We've been free from the law of Moses. But just because we're free from the law of Moses, that doesn't mean that, okay, then uh, I can ignore a lot of the good concepts from the law of Moses that I should apply in my life. No, you don't want to be hyper-dispensational. Then you're abusing it. You're abusing your liberty. No, there are some good things in the law of Moses that you should practice. That will be beneficial in your life, and you know it. And you know it. I mean, obviously, the law of Moses mentioned uh, the, the only command that forbade uh, kidnapping or selling off your daughter for prostitution is actually the Old Testament law. Are you telling me then that you're going to get rid of that and justify selling off your daughter for prostitution? <laughs> See, that don't make sense. So obviously, if you're a very spiritually minded Christian, you're going to realize, hey, I'm going to realize that this is an important rule and this is good in what I learned in the Old Testament. Now, understanding that you've been called to liberty... That doesn't justify a lot of your fleshly things that you can get away with. The Bible says right here, the rule of moderation, but by love serve one another. What rule is that? How does it appear to others? If you truly love the other person, you're going to care that what you do can be a burden to that person. And then you're going to prevent yourself from doing that thing that hurts the other person. That is so important to understand. If you don't do that, then you're always not going to be balanced as a Christian. All right, I kind of raised the mic closer to my mouth. Uh, if it becomes very bad in audio, let me know. But notice the context again. Paul never left his mind about the rapture. Look at uh, verse 21. Envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell be you before, as I have also told you in time past that they which do such things shall not, what? Inherit the kingdom of God. See, Paul never got the rapture out of his mind. The judgment seat of Christ when God rewards him or penalizes him for his deeds. So that's so important. All right, let's go back to Philippians 4. All right, spent a long time on that passage, but that should incredibly help you about moderation. It's so interesting when... Whenever the Bible mentioned about moderation, you'll see a rapture. You will see the coming of the Lord somehow tied in there. Now, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Okay, I'm going to give you one of the secrets to prayer. This is very interesting. If you thought the verse we talked about was good enough, this is going to be even better. Okay, so I'm giving you a lot of good things tonight. Now, I never taught this lesson in prayer, actually. But here's another secret to the power of prayer that you want to learn, okay? So secret to answered prayers is this passage. But I believe there are so many people who do not really understand this verse even though they memorized it. This verse is actually one of those giveaways discussing about the secret to answered prayers. You might say, really, how do I do that? Well, let's look at this passage, and then I'll explain. Another verse that you should be memorizing. It says, be careful for nothing. So in other words, don't be full of care uh, about everything. So God says, be careful for nothing. So some people mistakenly take that as, well, that means that uh, we can be careless. We can be a wreck. So Brother Tom Cho used to believe in that, he would joke. So the idea is this. Obviously, it's not saying being careless or being a wreck. Because how do you know that? Because later on, notice that Paul commended them for being careful at verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also what? Careful. See, so Paul recommended their carefulness. So he wasn't condemning about, you know, being careful. What's the idea here? Well, Paul already gave you the answer at verse 10 concerning what carefulness means. Carefulness meant full care. See that? He already gave you the answer. 
Look at the wording here. The King James Bible is easier to understand than modern versions. You might say, oh, it's so difficult. The King James Bible should have used a different word. No. Careful. Look at this. Full of what? Care. Let me put this as caps and exclamation point for some of you who think English is so hard. It's full of care. That's the idea. So go to 1 Corinthians 7. Remember that passage? There are people who are full of the what cares of this world. Yeah. <clears throat> so Paul, he's, he doesn't want them to abuse it. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Remember when we read verse 33? But he that is married, what? Careth for the things that are of the world. But remember, that context had to do with moderation, right? Remember? Well, Philippians 4 was about moderation at verse 5. Remember? So that's the whole idea. It had to do with, obviously, the cares of this world. So Paul's saying, be careful for nothing. Why? Because moderation again. Don't spend so much time abusing it. Because Christ is coming soon. But there's a better benefit to this. You know why you should be moderate? You know why you shouldn't be full of the cares of this world? I pity people who spend so much time on the cares of this world and justify it and think they're right with God. You might say, well, why do you pity them? Because the reason why is, I bet you you don't have peace then. If you spend so much time on this, ladies, sometimes I wonder if you're at peace Some, about how... When you go outside, oh man, how do people perceive me? Oh, I look so ugly. That kind of mind happens. I wonder those of you who spend too much time on television or on the screen, do you have peace? I doubt that. What happens? Because you feed the flesh so much. So what happens? It becomes groggy. It becomes isolated. It becomes moody. That's what happens. Full of worry. You don't have peace. Especially if you watch the screen in today's year. Yeah always freaking you out, always scaring you. Propaganda after fake news after fake news given to you just makes you sick and full of worry and fear. They, these people have no peace. Notice right here the context is what? At verse 7, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. See that? If you're full of the cares of this world, you got no peace. But if you're careful for nothing, see that? Then what happens? You're letting go of all the world. And when you do that, you could care less if the whole world goes to hell then. And if the whole world goes to hell, imagine still being you. Still being content, being peaceful about it. So that's why you should practice moderation. I think verse 6, is a, verse six and 7 might be the third rule to help you on moderation. So the third rule, believe it or not, right here is, do you have peace? Then you'll know if you're moderate or not. See if you're full of peace. After abusing your coffee, let's see if you're full of peace after that when that thing goes to hell, all right? <laughs> if you're not in peace, then you're not practicing moderation, all right? Yeah, you're in pieces, yes, brother, Amen. You might do a teaching on honey and coffee one day. All right, so <laughs> Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. But now let's get down to prayer here, the secret power to prayer. All right, this is my favorite topic for tonight. But in everything by prayer and supplication. So Paul's saying don't be full of the care of this world. So you got to let it go. Yeah. All right, be careful for nothing. Let it go to what? Prayer. Everything. Everything that goes on in your life, give it up to prayer. Notice it says, and supplication. So supplication is another word for prayer. Why? You're uh, giving a supplication, basically the request to the Lord, and he's supplying for you. So prayer and supplication. So give it up to the Lord, because he's the ultimate supplier. And then if you do that, notice it says, with thanksgiving. So you have to do it with gratefulness. Let your request be made known unto God. So when you give, so this is the secret power to prayer. Listen, you, how do you get your request known to God? You notice that? 
A lot of you are making your request known unto God and we write it on the board during prayer meeting. But in order to get your request known to God, notice it says right here, there are two things. One, two secrets here. So it's two secrets, not one. It's two. There are two secrets. And when I practiced this, it did transform my life. I, I saw the answer like even like the same day, surprisingly, sometimes. Now, not all the time will it do that, but you'd be surprised how sometimes the Lord might answer your prayer beyond what you expect. All right, here's the two things that uh, is a no-brainer, but it's a deep secret that you never thought of before. You ready? They are as follows. One is found in that verse. It's called consecration. A full surrender, right? That's consecration. It's a full surrender. It's giving up. It's abdicating everything about you, yourself. Think about it. When you're praying to the Lord, how can God answer the prayer if you take some control yourself? See that? That's why prayers don't get mightily answered. They only get partially answered. Why? God's thinking, well, it's partially answered by you anyway, not by me. So you take care of it. That's a problem with people. They get, why? Because of the care of this world. They feel like they have to do something themselves. Now, when bad things happen and then you have in your mind, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You just lost your prayer answer. You might say, why is that? Because, see, you automatically put your care into it. That's why that verse says, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, you're giving it up. You're surrendering it to God. Uh, when I do my prayers, I do this. I say, Lord, uh, I can't change so-and-so uh, in the church or in my family. And I can try as I might, and I'll follow your biblical principle, but you do know this God. It doesn't matter. The best of my ability, I cannot change that person. It all has to be you. I take zero credit for it. And even if there's something that changed within that person through my ability, I'm going to know automatically, Lord, that that wasn't mine because I know what I am. I am absolutely nothing without you. And you're the only one that gave me that ability too, if it was anything of myself. So Father, I'm completely depending on you to take care of this, not on myself. Gene Kim is nothing. So will you take care of this problem for me? Now when that happens, then the Lord answers better. Look at 1 Peter 5. You, remember, you know this verse, but you just never thought of this. Look at 1 Peter 5. Notice that it matches with Philippians 4. Look at 1 Peter 5. Look at verse 7. Remember, the context has to do with cares, right? Now, what do you need to do with these cares? These cares have to be consecrated, fully surrender, give up to the Lord. I mean, you memorize that verse. You just didn't believe it. The verse says, you know that famous passage, at verse 7, casting all your what? Care. care. It, did it say care? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that what Philippians 4 already told you? Then why didn't you pay attention? You're so, you memorized it, but you just memorized it like a robot. Your heart wasn't into it. You didn't take time to meditate into his word, did you? Or in that verse. Every word or ponder it. Study it. Compare scripture with scripture. Then it would have helped you. God said, that's a, supposed to be an encouraging verse. God cares for us. That's why fully surrender, give it up to him. I mean, look, he cares when the bad thing happens. When bad things happen, it's so easy to have a, a woe is me mindset. Or that the whole world is against me mindset. It's so easy to do that. But that's your problem. You didn't give that up to the Lord. There's something you're clinging on to the care, aren't you? Unless I have this, then I cannot be happy. Oh, you're clinging on to a care of this world. Let it go, that care. What if it's gone? Then you can be at peace. 
because you give it up to the Lord. You say, Lord, whether I get it or not, you're in control and I'll be happy. You give it up to the Lord and then guess what? Then he'll answer your prayer better. But there's a certain care in there. Uh, why? Because you're full of yourself. Verse 6. Why do you think Peter wrote this behind it? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, period. Is that right? Period? Or did it say colon? You didn't pay attention, did you, in that verse? Colon what? Meaning what? Why should you humble yourself? Because you're casting your care upon him. What is this when you give up and consecrate yourself to the Lord? This is the definition of humility. Remember, what's that prayer that I gave? The prayer is, Lord, I am absolutely nothing without you. Gene Kim takes zero credit, Father. And no matter what I do, I'm going to mess it up. Father God, I fully surrender to you. And what if I mess it up? Gene Kim is a mess up, Lord. I humble myself. I claim the promise of Romans 8, 28. Yes. Then that's me giving up even my mistakes to the Lord. Then I get so much more peace. Yes. But see, you keep your mistakes. You have a care of this world. Mistake is part of the cares of this world. What? What is, why do you have, why is that a part of the cares of this world? It's called pride. It's called reputation and ego and self. How you look good. Now, is this making sense or is this a little too deep that you're getting lost? Or maybe the silence is conviction or something. So then, the thing is, this is very eye-opening. It'll transform your prayer life. It'll transform your prayer life. That's why, go back to Philippians 4. This makes sense now. Philippians 4. Now, I'm going to combine verse 7, all right? I, know, I didn't finish verse 6 yet, but let me explain verse 7. That way I can combine it. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. So God's peace can finally flood your soul through this type of prayer. And notice it's supposed to surpass human understanding. See that? When you put human understanding there, like I have to make things sense. I have to make things sense. And I have to find an answer to this tomorrow. And I'm not going to get no peace unless, you take, unless I find an answer or I resolve this. That's your human understanding that interferes with that peace of God. What's that? Clinging on to care of this world. And that's not casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Well, it's, it's, uh, what if it's my mistake and you don't believe Romans 8, 28? And that's not giving up even your mistakes to the Lord. Let me write mistakes. Why? Because you're too stupid. You human beings are too stupid, too evil, too forgetful, too ignorant that you don't understand until it's written out for you and drawn on a whiteboard. Yeah, I'm kicking myself too. That means consecrating, giving up this too. Okay? That's the cares. All of that consecrated surrender to God. And just be humble to admit that you're stupid and you're wicked. And you're weak without Him. And maybe the Lord, then He'll answer the prayer, realizing there's nothing He's clinging on to of Himself. He realizes where He's at. And He's completely depending on me to take care of everything. Okay? Okay? It's going to keep your heart and even your mind. See, that's the problem why you don't get peace. Why? Your feelings, feelings, how you feel, and then you get tense. That's the heart. Your mind, thinking, thinking, all these thoughts. What if this happened, that happened? That's your mind. Your heart and mind has no peace. Why? Because you didn't consecrate to the Lord. You didn't give it up. Give it up to the Lord. Amen. Give it up to the Lord. Here's another, uh, another powerful thing which you never thought of before. One of the most powerful things about doing this, when you surrender everything to the Lord, then that means this. When He answers your prayer, He'll answer your prayer as follows. Three ways, which you know, right? There are three ways. It's yes, wait, and no.
Here's how you get peace. When you get peace to answered prayers, the idea is that you consecrate yourself to however way he answers this. So when he says wait, yes and no, if you fully surrender to that, then you get peace about it. You get more peace. One of the secrets to answered prayers is if it's according to the will of God, remember. So that's very important. You got to realize that when, even if it's wait or no, that's still an answered prayer. And that's a mighty answer to prayer. People always look at the yes part. No, you can't look at the yes. You got to look at the no part. Do you forget the blessings and the miracles of how God mightily answered your prayer with no? Yeah, you remember what, what happened when he said no. It saved your life. It saved you from making a deeper mistake. All right, now, when it did, here's the thing that you forgot. Verse 6, a secret answer to prayer. And this does work, but you forgot this. The Bible says, verse 6, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with what? Thanksgiving. thanksgiving. You have to give him thanks. Now, when is the last time you thanked the Lord after you prayed? You never give him thanks. Think about it. If you've done... Uh, if if you've done something for your child, every time the child requested something from you, and then the child never thanked you once, you think you're going to keep answering that child's request? No, you're going to think the child is spoiled. Now, what do you think is in the mind of God the Father every time he answers your prayer, but you didn't thank him once? Mm, then you're spoiled. You're fleshly. And that's why God hasn't been answering your prayers. You think you're spiritual because you prayed about that request, didn't you? Mm. No, you were spoiled. You were fleshly. No, you weren't being spiritual. I'll tell you what's spiritual. When you talk to God about it with consecration and thanksgiving, then that's spiritual. When's the last time you thanked him? You know what's, um, here's another thing that I do. I don't know if you've ever done this. The verse says, if you pay attention, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, right? So this is very important to understand. Do you know how you can get an answered prayer? That verse says that particular thing, I mean, look at that verse, all right? Look at your King James Bible. Don't look at me like a tree full of owls and say, oh, yeah, oh, Pastor Kim, must be right. No, 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 just check if I'm wrong there. Look at this. This will be eye-opening. In that particular thing, you consecrated to the Lord. So far, can we agree? All right? That you've given up to the Lord. That particular thing, you have to thank Him at the same time. Then do you think the Lord will answer the prayer? Here's an example. Lord, I pray for so-and-so's soul to get saved. That person is uh, keep rejecting the gospel and Jesus Christ, and I'm praying for that soul to get saved. But thank you, Lord, that the person heard me out about the gospel. The person never did that before, I remember. Was always resistant. Thank you, Lord, that the person's heart was softened and the seed was planted. And you can do so much more, Heavenly Father. And that's the thing about Thanksgiving. It comes together one of the secrets to answer prayers that I taught you was what? It's to give, concentrate on the glory of God, right? What glorifies God? Do you think about the glory of God? When you combine thanksgiving, usually, look at the prayers of, in the Psalms, for example. When there's always thanksgiving, there's always glorifying the Lord. So then when you thank the Lord for that seed being planted in that person, do you glorify him? Do you say, God, nothing's too hard for you. You can say, you, can, uh, you know what factors would be in place to make that soul repent, have the fear of the Lord, and get saved. What do you think the Lord's going to do? Oh, yeah, he recognizes I'm powerful enough. Well, I have the strength to do it. And then don't you think the answered prayer will come out even more? So not just thanking him in prayer. Everyone thanks the Lord for their food before they eat, all right? That's why you never had a stomachache yet, all right? 
because the Lord answered your prayer on your food, but you didn't do that with church, you didn't do that with uh, your life, your work issues, family issues, etc. You know. But the thing is, is that when's the last? Uh, but here's the thing: it's not just a regular thanks and prayer. This is in that particular thing that you need God to answer. In that particular request you're bestowing on God that you want him to take care of. In that particular request, when you combine that particular thing with thanks while glorifying him, what do you think the Lord's going to do? You think he's going to sit up in heaven and, and not do anything about it? Or do you think he'll answer that prayer, the child of that prayer even more? All right, think about that one. So that's so important. That, this is, these are the greatest secrets in your prayer life. Now, let me show you something amazing about this that goes with this secret to prayer. Go to, uh, yeah, I'll have to wrap it up. Okay, go to Romans 8 and Matthew 21. I at least have to finish this prayer part. I don't, to stop it midway would just ruin everything. All right, let's look at Romans 8 and Matthew 21. Romans 8. And Matthew chapter 21. Now this is extremely powerful here. Philipp, uh, Philippians 4, 7 also told you why God can answer the prayers. Didn't you know that? Philippians 4, 7 gave you the answer on why God would answer the prayer. You might say, how? Why? Then here's the idea. First of all, go to Matthew chapter 21. Now notice what Jesus told his disciples at verse 22. And all things, see that? That's the same thing with everything by prayer and supplication. All things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. So notice that the Bible reads here that everything you should be doing should be surrendered to prayer. Don't cling on to that care. Like every detail. I mean, the thing is, is that you're so good at talking about uh, your problems to a person who's, uh, or a, a human comforter, but not to God. And then this thing, you have to spend all that time on the Lord and very little on people. You might say, why so? Because very, people will let you down. People can misunderstand, and people don't really understand your pain compared to God. All of this should dump to the Lord more. And when you spend this more on the Lord, what happens? When you spend it more on the Lord, then at the same time, it has to have, remember another one of the secrets to prayer is what? Believing, right? So it has to have faith. Consecration, it follows along faith. Why? You're believing that when you give it up to the Lord, He's going to answer it the best. So it's so important that you have faith in that. You total, totally believe, God, I depend everything on you. Consecration goes along with thanksgiving. The more dependent you are on God, the more you'll see His answer and the more you're thankful about it. And the more you're thankful about it, what happens? It infects it in return where you become more dependent on God. All right, all of this is intertwined together. Humility, faith, consecration, thanksgiving, glorifying the Lord. All of it is intertwined. Now, Jesus promised that you're going to receive it. And then you go, well, I don't get yes all the time. I don't receive it. Look at Romans 8. Romans 8. This is powerful right here, Romans 8. This is one of my favorite verses, and this is a prayer that I pray. Sometimes you'll notice your preacher praying that. When I pray, I realize that I am totally worthless and uh, totally full of flesh that I can make mistakes when I pray. I don't know if you believe that. When you pray, do you believe that you can make the mistakes while you're praying? Oh, yeah. If you believe in that, and you think about that when you pray, the more consecrated you are to God to give up to Him to take care of your prayers. Now look at this. Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, right? For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. You have so much pain, infirmities, trials. So then you're praying for it, but it's not the right way. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. 
And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints, what? According to the will of God. Now, this is something that we shout about, and you'll hear this sometimes from some people, is that basically, when you surrender your prayer to the Lord, Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ takes that prayer request of yours and writes it with a red pen and marks it all down, cleanses it with his blood, and he says, Lord, what Gene Kim meant by his prayer by, Oh God, I don't know, blah, 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 blah. Ah, I don't know what's going on, and it's the end of the world. Ah! Lord, what Gene Kim meant by that, and then he'll write it, is, Lord, save me. Yeah. I am stupid. Yeah. I am full of emotions right now that I can't pray right. And I am so selfish that I can't think about others right now. And Lord, I am in so much pain that I can't describe it well. And I might be in sin by doing this. Will you intercede on my behalf and help me? Yeah, praise God. Amen, right? Yeah, that's what, that's what Jesus does. So then God answers the prayer that is according to his will in a mighty way. And then when he says, wait and no, it follows with his will. When he says, yes, it's according to his will. Now, this is what makes it even, uh, so that's one. But here's number two right here. Number two is this. Number two that I taught you before, there are people who pray by faith and believe that it was going to happen when they prayed for it, and it did happen. So in other words, their answers were yes. Why? Because they knew what God would say yes to. That is a key ingredient secret in the power of prayer that I taught you before. But basically, I taught you how do you get those yes prayer requests. It's because it's according to the will of God. So in other words, if you're so much following the will of God, then you know what the Father's will is. And hence, once you know his will, because you read that book so much, you prayed to him so much, you have a deep walk relationship with the Father. A child knows what the Father would say yes to. So when that child has such a deep, strong relationship with the Father, full of experience and the Holy Ghost, he knows his will. And when he knows his will, when he gives a request, he's going to know that's God's will. So not only, so there are two benefits to the will of God. One, you have such a deep relationship to God the Father that you know he'll say yes according to his will. But then, secondly, if you don't have that strong of a relationship with God the Father, Glory to God, you should be shouting, Jesus Christ will correct your prayer and make sure it's according to his will. Now that's a good, now that should, and then those things should give you what, verse 7? The peace of God. Why? How do you know that all follows with the will of God in prayer? Because the last part reads, through what? Through Christ Jesus. How you get peace is when you're in the will of God. The point is, everything has to be to the will of God. But if your will conflicts with God's will, then guess what? Everything in these prayers is not going to work. Because everything underlies with what is God's will? What is God's will? What is God's will? If your prayers align with the will of God, guess what? Then you're going to have utmost peace about it. But I know why you don't get peace when you pray. Sometimes you're not sure what God's will is. Well, if you have a deep relationship with God, you wouldn't know his will, and you would be more in peace about it. Well, I don't have that strong of a relationship. Then how do I get peace? The second way, remember? Jesus Christ corrects your prayer. And that comes to what? Consecration. See, you didn't fully surrender. You didn't fully consecrate. That's why you have no peace. One thing I learned in life is this, is that the more I understood about God's will, the more I was at peace in prayer, whether he said yes, no, or wait. Like, um, a great example is this, as I close this, okay? Uh, you know that yours truly went through so many demonic attacks, okay? And then it was so much to a point where I was even exerting, over-exhausting my health, getting sick, and it was hurting myself, even my own family, even my effectiveness in the church, but then when I prayed to the Lord about uh, slowing down these demonic attacks or preventing them, guess what? I, I was at peace when I prayed about it, when I fully surrendered. You might say, why? 
Because you know that sometimes a demonic attack happens. Yeah, but I do know this. It's not supposed to be a point where I become sad and miserable and overexhaust myself and my health. So then I knew when I prayed to the Lord about that, Lord, just slow it down right here. I knew God was going to answer that. I didn't say take away the demonic attacks and eliminate it all. I said, Lord, just slow it down to something I can handle. And let me have some moments over there where I can be happy because it's not your will that I be miserable and sad. He answered my prayer. Amen. See what? That's an example of knowing so much of God's will that you get peace. And when I pray, I'm at peace when I pray something like that. But you're not. I wonder why. You don't know much about his will. And, the, and until you get a deeper relationship with God, you'll know his will. That's one. Secondly, it's when you consecrate, fully surrender to his will. That's how you get peace. All right, I gave the secrets of prayer. I got to close. <laughs> Father God, I pray tonight's teaching have been life-changing. And I mean that, Lord, life-changing to our prayer life. May we be able to live uh, more freely, more at peace, more righteously, and a deeper relationship with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.